guys, my name is Joanna, also known as Just Another Flutist here on YouTube, and today I thought I would talk about my sight singing and ear training textbooks. So I accidentally started this back to school theme a couple of weeks ago when I talked about how I failed one of my music history exams. And then I decided to show you guys a music theory project that I did, that is the Sonata Form project. I did react to it. I even put the parts up on my blog. And so I thought for today, because it is the first Saturday of September, you guys have either just started school about one or two weeks, or you are about to start school depending on where you're going to school around the world. Prior to entering music school, the only experience I had with ear training was identifying intervals. So these would be harmonic or melodic intervals, basically if you play the intervals together on the piano and when you play them broken on the piano, one note after another. From what I recall, I only had to do a little bit of this at the ends of my piano exams. Mostly it was just to test that you weren't completely tone deaf, but I had no more training than just that. I did think it was a little bit strange though because my mom took ABRSM and she is able to sing back a melody that she has just heard in solfege. I did think it was kind of strange that I never officially learned solfege in the many years that I spent studying the flute and piano. I started studying the piano when I was seven and I started studying the flute when I was almost nine. I do remember my mom tried to teach me to sing back melodies to her using solfege. The only song I could do it to was, of course, the Do Re Mi song from The Sound of Music. I had no kind of like frame of reference in terms of like which were the important notes of the scale. I didn't know how to listen for distinct intervals that would signal cadence. So I walk into music school and I am assigned these two textbooks. These are probably old editions by now. So this one is the Manual for Ear Training and Sight Singing by Gary S. Karpinski. And this is the accompanying anthology for sight singing by Gary S. Karpinski and Richard Cram. If you haven't seen it already, I did make a video about my first experience with college level ear training. I actually failed the first course. So if you want the story about that, I will link it up here for you guys. Long story short, in the years prior to me entering the University of British Columbia's School of Music, the ear training course was actually part of the theory course. If you did really badly in ear training, that didn't necessarily mean that you failed the course because you could have done really well on theory and that would have pulled up your mark. In my year, they decided to split up theory from ear training and sight singing. So ear training and sight singing became its own course. So now, as you can imagine, because they did this fresh split, this new course for ear training and sight singing was not very clearly defined as to what they were expecting from us. So each professor who taught it actually ended up teaching slightly different things. And so it was very confusing as to what would be expected from all of us in the final exam. The perfect pitch people, of course, had no problem with this course because they have perfect pitch. But for the rest of us who do not have perfect pitch, it was quite the disaster. In any case, I do hear that now the courses have been greatly improved. I don't know if they still use these, but in my year they did. So I thought I would share them with you guys. Let's start with this manual for ear training and sight singing. When I was taking this course and we were going through the material, I thought it was kind of weird that it was actually teaching you theory and then making you sing the theory. The weird thing for me was that I'm very good at written theory. If you were to give me a theory exam and you were to tell me to identify things, analyze things and whatever, I would actually do a really good job. At that point, I thought it was a waste of time because I was like, why am I doubling up on the theory and then doing this weird thing about singing my theory? Now though, I realize what this book is trying to do. So the idea is that when you listen to a phrase being dictated to you, you would be able to hear how the melody is constructed out of chords. And if you understand how one chord voice leads quite nicely into another chord, it will give you a much stronger framework for you to identify the correct notes for that melody. Eventually, we also were expected to be able to write down a dictation for multiple voices. By learning the theory behind it, you'll know that this chord can only go into so many other chords. Basically, you are doing process of elimination. So you can eliminate a number of chords that this one can go into. So as you can see, it makes dictation easier because then you're not just wildly guessing if you really are having trouble identifying the notes. You have some sort of framework and even if you guess it 
slightly wrong, it's only slightly wrong. You'll only be off by a couple of notes or something like that. That's what I figured out a little bit too late. I didn't figure this whole thing out until the second time I took the first sight singing course. So I hope that you guys don't have to go through the same thing as me. The second book we had is this anthology of sight singing and it's really just a book of singing examples. So most of our sight singing exams were taken from this book. They would assign you I think like 20 examples to practice and then they would pick like three or four of them for you to sing in front of them. Sometimes it was random and then what they would do is either pick another example that is in here for you to sight sing that they didn't assign for you to practice or the professor would make up their own melody and have you sight sing it. Whatever melody they gave you to sight read always reflects what you learned in the course. So they should not give you any surprises. Most of these excerpts in here are for a single voice. There are a few for two or three voices but we hardly ever used those, at least in UBC. I personally felt that these books were trying to make a very strong framework within your own head so that you're not just relying on other people to hear what you're supposed to sing. It really wanted you to develop your own strong relative pitch. Now, the thing is, those were not the only ear training and sight singing textbooks I worked from. Why is this the case? When I entered my master's, I had to take remedial courses in ear training, counterpoint, and early music history. And I was not the only person who had to do it. Every single master's student in SF State that did not go directly from their bachelor's in San Francisco State into their master's, so basically everyone who came in from a different school had to take remedial courses. Now, I don't regret taking these remedial courses though. Yes, my first semester at San Francisco State was intense. I was at school for like upwards of 12 hours a day because my courses were so jam packed together. I do not regret taking ear training at SF State. My professor was Dr. David Ickes. He's amazing. I believe he wrote an ear training or sight singing book too. A hard professor, but you really need it for ear training and he did it well. These were the textbooks that we were given. Music for Ear Training. This is the third edition by Michael Horvitt, Timothy Cousin, and Robert Nelson. And this is just a workbook. So you see all these like empty pages here empty, empty pages. There is a CD back here. We were assigned certain pages that we needed to turn in. Pop the CD into your laptop, listen to the appropriate exercises, and they were just dictations. You would write down what you heard. This was just a really great way to force us to do a lot of dictation on our own time. You only really needed to do about five to 10 minutes of it a day. You wanted to work it into your routine. Once you work it into your routine, your brain actually kind of starts to attune itself to listening to melodies. You start hearing the framework. You start hearing the important cadences. You start hearing important intervals. You actually start hearing the chords. And it's simply because your mind is getting used to it. Prior to taking this course, I did not implement ear training into my daily routine. The thing is, you don't have to do much of it. Okay, you don't have to spend like half an hour or one hour on ear training every day. You really don't. Just block out five to ten minutes and do it. Within the time it takes you to watch this video, you would have been done your ear training routine for the day. So it wasn't assigned day by day. It was more like you have this block of stuff to do, do it by this day. So you could either cram it for like a couple hours on like the last day or you could be like me and just do like five and 10 minutes of it every single day. Now we have this, this is Music for Sight Singing, the seventh edition by Robert W. Ottman and Nancy Rogers. And these are all melodies. It's kind of like the anthology here. These two textbooks are very similar. They give you excerpts to sing, you practice them at home and you sing them in class. Typically you would practice at a piano. You want to pretend that you are just memorizing a song. The only thing different is that the syllables are solfege. This is really good to kind of brute force a melody into your mind and to brute force this solfege that goes with the melody into your mind. It's really good to do in the beginning when your brain is still getting used to hearing how notes are related to each other and stuff like that. The following class when you come in, you either volunteer to sing it in front of the entire class 
or you get called upon. Either way, you had to have a certain number of times that you sang in class throughout the entirety of the course. What this did was it kind of helped us desensitize ourselves to singing in front of people. And the nice thing, of course, was that he would help correct us and he would use someone singing it as a teaching moment. So it became kind of like a masterclass for sight singing, which I loved. Constantly doing that really helps desensitize you for the final exam. Now we have the Kodai choral method. These are two part exercises. So you got together with a partner and then you would practice these. As you can see, this type of practicing sight singing forces you to learn how to sing and how to hear what other people are singing while you are actively singing. So it splits your mind into two. In one sense, you need to know exactly where you stand in your singing. So what is your framework that you're working with? On the other hand, you have to make sure that you are still singing in tune and in the same chord as your partner. This skill, I realized later, comes into great use when you are playing in an ensemble because then you are trained to not only focus on getting your own notes right, but also focus on where you are in comparison to the other people who are playing around you. Without even looking at their music, you can tell if you are in the correct chord or not with them. You can tell if you are actually in tune with them or not. The last book that we have is Classical Canons, compiled and commentaries by Molnar Antal. This looks like it's single line, single voice, sight singing excerpts, right? Wrong. These are, as it says, canons. When you look at an excerpt, you will see one and then you will see two. Then later on the music, you'll see three. Later on the music, you'll see four. These are just like those nursery rhyme canons that you, you know, sang when you were five years old in your class with your kindergarten teacher. But now you're doing it with solfege and reading music to go along with it. The first person will start singing by themselves. By the time you get to number two, the second person starts singing from the beginning. And these are all really beautiful, okay? So you end up singing in harmony with each other, even though you are singing the same part, but just staggered. I felt that singing in canon was sort of the next level up from singing in a duet with other people. Because when you sing in a duet with other people, you see like there's two parts, right? So that means that you can see what the other person is singing on your part as you're singing. So there's no guessing, okay? Like you know if the other person is singing right, you know if you're singing right. Here in a canon, you can't actually concentrate on what the other person is singing because you'll end up singing their part because you'll see it staggered behind you or in front of you. This really forces you to listen and concentrate on your own part. It forces you to learn to trust your group members to sing their part correctly. And it forces you to listen to the entire group singing together to make sure that you're all in tune with each other. If we ran into a chord that sounded weird, we would figure out which note everyone is landing on in their music, and then we would play it on the piano. The piano itself is equal temperament, it's not just intonation, so we did have to kind of tweak our tuning a little bit, but at least the piano gives you a really good idea of where it's supposed to lie, like what the note is supposed to be. So at least you're not singing an entirely wrong note. Everything that we learned in class would be applied here. And there was no way to go around it. You could not not learn solfege correctly when singing in canon. And there you have it. Those were the textbooks that I used to study ear training and sight singing in two different universities. So as you can see, each university really has their kind of their own way of teaching ear training and sight singing. I was really lucky to be able to see it from two different perspectives. And I definitely feel that learning it from two different perspectives really made my ear training and sight singing a lot stronger. I definitely may not have been the best student, but I still learned a heck of a lot. For those of you who have been in music school for a little while now, please share in the comments below your experience with your ear training and sight singing course. Talk about your textbooks, talk about your syllabus, talk about your professors. I think it would be so great for us to share all of our different experiences with this. And for those of you who are entering music school and are about to learn ear training, don't worry. You 
you will be fine. There are a whole bunch of us ahead of you who came out okay. So don't worry, just make sure you practice a little bit every day. And as usual, if you guys like this video, make sure you give me a big thumbs up and hit subscribe for new videos every Saturday. My last video is over there. And if you want to catch me during the week, my social media networks are down there. But otherwise, I will see you guys next week. Bye. Very rudimentary ear training for me. Like even when I did do some ear training before music school, it wasn't the best. And I say rudimentary because I actually sucked at distinguishing between like perfect fourths and perfect fifths, major six and minor six. I also always got like a minor six and a minor seventh mixed up. Very clearly it was not my forte.